All right, so it's 9 a.m. here in DC, 9.01 a.m. here in DC, 9 p.m. in Singapore. We are all set to start today's webinar called Opportunities and Challenges in Light of the Singapore Convention on Mediation. I am Celeste Salinas Quero, ICSID Legal Counsel, and on behalf of Young ICSID, I am delighted to welcome all of you um, to this webinar jointly organized with Young and Sonia. Uh, before we move on to discuss today's topic, I would like to address a few housekeeping matters with our participants. Um, we encourage you to send us um, all your questions during the, uh, during the webinar by using our Q&A tool. So if you look to the right side of your screen, on the top of your screen, you will see that there's a link saying Q&A. You can click on that link and then a little box will pop up on the bottom of your screen to the right side. And you can type in your question in that box and then to submit the question, you should select the alternative then to post or send to Damon uh, Ms. Dumberg, who is our communications officer, and then Damon will, will um, pass along your question to our moderator. Um, during the webinar, uh, participants will be muted at all times, and I kindly ask our panelists to please remain muted if you're not presenting. Now, an important rule for our participants is that you're free to use the information received today during the webinar, but please know that you may not reveal the identity or the affiliation of the speakers, no doubt of any other participant of today's webinar. So, having dealt with those housekeeping matters, I am very happy to introduce part of today's panel. Among our speakers today is Ms. Judith Sieper. Judith is legal officer at the Secretariat of the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law and Control in Vienna. Until her appointment to the Secretariat, she didn't work for several years in a law firm in Frankfurt, and she also worked in Southeast Europe for numerous donors and organizations like the OSCE, World Bank, and the German International Cooperation Agency, CIB. She did obtain both legal state exams and her PhD in Frankfurt, and she is qualified and certified as a patient. We also have in today's panel Ms. Frau Kanitschke, who is senior counsel at ICSID. She is also in lead for ICSID staff in English. Frauke also serves as the Secretary of Tribunals, Reconciliation Commission, and Ad Hoc Committees in relation to the proceedings conducted under the ICSID Convention with additional facility rules. Frauke further leads ICSID investor state mediation activities, including the drafting of proposed mediation rules and amendments to ICSID Communication Framework. She is an accredited mediator and she is admitted to the Administrator State Bar. She holds a law degree from the University of Berlin, an LLM from Georgetown University Law Center, and a master's degree in psychology from San Jose at Um So I welcome both Judith and Frau to her panel. And now I would like to yield the floor to Ms. Kirsten Teo. She's counsel at the Almeida Pereira. And uh, she's a representative of Young SAAC, who will introduce, introduce the rest. Thank you very much, Celeste. It has been a wonderful privilege to collaborate and co-organize this event with you and the Young Exit team. Thank you. It's now, thank you. It's now an honor to introduce the following speakers and moderator for this panel. First, Mr. George Lim is a senior counsel in Singapore and chairman of the Singapore International Mediation Center. He is a past president of the Law Society of Singapore and serves on SIAC's International Arbitration Panel. George was Singapore's mediation consultant to Unsitual Working Group 2, which led to the signing of the Singapore Convention on Mediation on 7 August 2019. Ms. Natalie Y. Morris Sharma is currently with the International Law Department of the Attorney General's Chambers in Singapore. Previously, she has served in capacities including as Director of the International Legal Division in Singapore's Ministry of Law and Legal Advisor to Singapore's Permanent Mission to the UN in New York. Natalie has participated in several bilateral and multilateral negotiations, including trade and investment agreement negotiations, and at UNCITROL. At UNCITROL, her recent roles have included as chairperson of the UNCITROL Working Group 2 on Dispute Settlement, or its work on the Singapore Convention on Mediation and Amended Model Law on Mediation. Natalie currently serves as rapporteur to UNCITROL Working Group 3 on Investor State Dispute Settlement Reform. We have Mr. Gary Bourne, who is chairman of the International Arbitration Group at Wilma Cutler, Pickering Hale and Dole, LLP. 
He also serves as president of the Singapore International Arbitration Center, Court of Arbitration. Mr. Bourne has served as counsel in over 675 arbitrations, including several of the largest arbitrations in ICC and ad hoc history, and has sat as arbitrator in more than 250 international and ad hoc arbitrations. He is a preeminent authority in the field, renowned as the author of International Commercial Arbitration 2nd Edition 2014, the leading treatise on the subject. He is also the author of International Arbitration Law and Practice 2nd Edition 2016, International Civil Litigation in U.S. Court 6th Edition 2018, and a number of other works. Mr. Bourne is an honorary professor of law at the University of St. Gallen, Switzerland, and Tsinghua University, Beijing, China and teaches widely at law schools in Europe, Asia, and North and South America. As moderator for this panel, we are pleased to introduce Mr. Diogo Pereira. Diogo is an international lawyer at D. Almeida Pereira in Washington, D.C., specializing in international arbitration, public international law, and investigations relating to corruption, money laundering, sanctions, and terrorist finance. His practice focuses in all aspects of international disputes and investigations with significant mandates in Latin America, Europe, the U.S., and the Middle East. Now, without further ado, I hand over the floor to Diogo. Diogo, please. Thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you, Kirsten, for the very kind introduction. Um, so today we're all here to speak about opportunities and challenges uh, in light of the Singapore Convention on Mediation. Um, we have a very esteemed panel, as you've heard from the introduction, and the way we're going to proceed today is we're going to start off with Natalie, uh, then to turn the floor to Judith, to Frauke, to George, and finally to Gary. Uh, we, each of the speakers will be speaking for approximately 10 minutes, and then we'll have uh, question and answers afterwards. So as Celeste uh, said, please don't hesitate to send uh, questions. Damien will be circulating them to me, and uh, we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So without further ado, I uh, pass the floor to Natalie. Thank you very much, Diogo, and uh, good evening, afternoon, and morning to one and all, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be a part of today's webinar. Um, I will be covering three questions during my presentation. First, what is the Singapore Convention? Second, why was there a need for the Singapore Convention? And third, what is the history of the development of the Convention? I will then wrap with brief remarks in conclusion. So the first question on what is the Singapore Convention? The Convention provides a framework for international commercial settlement agreements to be enforced and invoked across borders, much in the same way as the New York Convention provides for an international enforcement mechanism for arbitral awards. The text was finalized and adopted by UNCTRAL and the UN General Assembly in 2018, following a multilateral negotiation process. And this often involved 150 to 200 people in each session from different countries, cultures, languages, and professional backgrounds. And the convention opened for signature in Singapore on 7th August 2019, as Kirsten mentioned earlier. Already it has been signed by 52 countries from all the regions of the world, ratified by four countries, and will enter into force on 12th September this year. Very briefly, four points to highlight as an overview of what the convention is about. First, in terms of scope, the convention applies to settlement agreements resulting from mediation, not the agreement to mediate, unlike the New York Convention, which applies to agreements to arbitrate. Second, it does apply to ISBS, and in the negotiations, there was a proposal to limit the scope of the convention to commercial agreements between businesses only, but this was not accepted. There will be more on mediation and ISBS from the other later. Third, in terms of form, the convention may apply so long as the settlement agreement is in writing, signed by the parties, and so long as there is evidence that the settlement agreement resulted from mediation. And four, as, part of, as a key part of the convention, are the grounds of refusal, and these are limited to those that are set up in the convention. So now moving on to the second question on why was there a need for the Singapore Convention? Two points here. First, the interest in mediation as a form of dispute resolution grows. Our globalized world today is one of international commerce and cross-border relationships, and mediation offers the promise of cost-effective and time-effective dispute resolution. It allows parties to shape the way that disputes are resolved, in the way that suits them and their needs, as well as the opportunity to preserve their commercial relationship, which can be particularly valuable in the context, especially of things like long-term, large-scale, cross-border projects. However, the lack of a cross-border mechanism for giving legal effect to international mediated settlement agreements has been said to be a significant barrier to the use of mediation, and the Singapore Convention responds to this lack of an international enforcement mechanism. Second, even without the Singapore Convention, consent awards have been utilized strategically as a means of enforcement. 
in many ways, this has been endorsed by institutional rules which elaborate on hybrid dispute resolution processes. However, there are inherent uncertainties in this shoehorning approach. For example, if an arbitration is only commenced after the parties have reached a settlement, in many jurisdictions, the resulting award would not be one that settles differences between the parties, and the resulting award would therefore not fall within the scope of the New York Convention. Further, the New York Convention was designed for arbitral awards, and certain concepts do not sit well in the context of mediation or do not accommodate the specific features of mediation and the dispute resolution process. And this is where the Singapore Convention comes in. So this brings me to my third question. Uh, what is the history of the development of the convention? And really here, there are three milestone years, 2002, 2004, and 2017. The Singapore Convention is not Uncle Charles' first foray into seeking uh, to harmonize international laws on mediation or conciliation, the two terms being interchangeable for our purposes. In fact, the history of the convention is traceable to Uncle Charles' work prior to 2000. In 2002, Uncle Charles had adopted the model law on international commercial conciliation, and in the course of work on the 2002 model of law, views were divided on matters such as whether a settlement agreement uh, should be treated as enforceable title and or similarly to arbitral awards, whether there was a need for a harmonized enforcement mechanism, how to distinguish between mediated settlement agreements that should be capable of direct enforcement and those that should not. And at the end of the day, and not for want of trying, the differences in the approaches taken by various jurisdictions proved to be difficult to surmount. So in 2014, the US put the issue back on the table. The United States delegation proposed to develop a convention for mediated settlement agreements akin to what the New York Convention is for arbitral awards. Thereafter, we saw that the discussions and difficulties identified in the earlier answer trials leading up to the 2002 model law um, did not disappear when our work was taken up again and when it began in earnest in 2015. Of 2015 to 2017, in the course of negotiations, we worked to narrow the issues and in February 2017, we managed to resolve most of the difficult remaining issues as part of a five-issue package deal. It's useful to examine the five issues in the package deal to understand why the Singapore Convention takes certain positions and approaches. And so I will do so now. First, the legal effect of settlement agreements. Unlike the New York Convention, the term recognition and enforcement does not appear in the Singapore Convention. This is because of the different ways things work in common law jurisdictions and civil law jurisdictions. And so a functional approach to the concept of recognition and enforcement is reflected in the Singapore Convention instead. Second, treatment of settlement agreements concluded in the course of judicial or arbitral proceedings is such that the Singapore Convention does not apply the settlement agreements approved by a court or concluded in the course of court proceedings where they are enforceable as a judgment in the state of that court. The Convention also does not apply the settlement agreements recorded and enforceable as an arbitral award, and this is to avoid gaps and overlaps in the enforcement regimes of judgments, arbitral awards, and mediated settlement agreements. And it shows a keen awareness of how settlement agreements, judgments, and arbitral awards interact. And it's one reason why I think that the Singapore Convention does not spell the end of the use of consent awards, does not render them obsolete, but rather complements such tools. Third, the declaration of opt-in by the parties. The effect of such a declaration by a party to the Singapore Convention is that express consent to the enforcement, to the enforcement regime on the part of disputing parties would be a prerequisite for the Singapore Convention to apply. And this is not a declaration that we have in the New York Convention. Of the 52 signatories to the Singapore Convention, only Iran has made this declaration of our signature None of the ratifying countries have made such a declaration. And it is a declaration that gave comfort to some delegations that see express consent as a natural follow through of the consensual nature of mediation and party autonomy. And it's a declaration that some have said it may probably be withdrawn over time with 
the growth and familiarity with international mediation and understanding that they could be in line with the expectations of disputing parties, that their mediated settlement agreement reached would be impossible. The fourth issue is the impact of the mediation process and conduct of the mediators on the enforcement procedure. And the grounds of refusal specific to mediator misconduct were extensively negotiated. During the negotiation, the issue was whether there should be subject, um, th these matters should be the subject of specific defenses or whether they could be addressed by other grounds of refusal, such as the settlement agreement being null and void or for reasons of public policy. And in their final form, the enforcement of the settlement agreement may be refused where there was a form of breach of applicable standards or failure to disclose, which had a causal effect on the disputing party entering into the mediated settlement. The intention is for these grounds of refusal to apply only in, in exceptional circumstances. The fifth issue is the unprecedented step of developing both the Singapore Convention on Mediation and amendments to the model law of mediation in parallel. And this was done as part of the spirit of compromise to accommodate jurisdictions with less experience with international mediation and a benefit from the parallel development of the model law alongside the convention though is that now we have a ready model should countries need a reference point when crafting their domestic implementing legislation. So these five issues were amongst the most difficult issues in the negotiations because the strength of divergence is expressed in respect of each of them something that I know that one of the negotiators active in the project, Pat Actor, who's on the center as well in the audience, would similarly be able to attend to. And as mentioned earlier, I think that it is useful that we've taken some time to cover the issues in the package deal to better understand certain of the positions and approaches in the Singapore Convention. I briefly covered my three questions, um, and by way of concluding remarks, I would just say that I think the Singapore Convention will broaden the suite of options available to users of dispute resolution. Depending on various factors, urgency of the situation, subject matter of the dispute, relationship between the parties, disputing parties may choose litigation, arbitration, mediation, some combination of these to resolve their dispute. And what the Singapore Convention offers is a real choice between the different forms of dispute resolution and certainty in terms of what is the effect of that choice, specifically in the recognition and enforcement of the outcomes of the method of dispute resolution that is pursued, including mediation. Of course, the mechanism will be more effective and useful as more and more countries sign on, and I certainly hope that that will be the case. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Natalie. Um, so we've been receiving questions uh, from the audience, and we encourage you to continue submitting them. Um, and the first couple questions relate to the implementation. Uh, so the first one is rather straightforward. Uh, it's a question from Olga Tipsi, and it's just the question of how many countries have already ratified the Singapore Convention? So four countries have ratified the Singapore Convention, uh, and that's why it's crossed the threshold of the minimum number of three, and we'll see it enter into force on 12th of September later this year. And the next question comes from uh, Tapiwa Chivanga from Scanlan and Holderness from Zimbabwe. Uh, he asks about uh, Article 8 and the, the reservations that parties uh, can, uh, can make w when joining and, and when putting the convention into uh, practice. And he wants to know uh, to what extent that will limit the time span that the agreement actually becomes operational and how that will affect the implementation. Thank you. I think there was a bit of interference uh, in, this, in the network, so I couldn't catch the full question. Um, what I caught was the time span of the entry, the entry into force. His question was about the reservations and how that will affect the implementation. So the that's actually a um, good question because it's something that was very carefully considered during the negotiation. The reservations are intended to to offer comfort to potential signatory countries um, that if they have certain issues that they are less certain about, they are able to enter a reservation, a two, either one of the two reservations that are provided for in the convention, um, and so be able to become party. And as they gain comfort with the convention, uh, hopefully with time, then they can decide what they want to do with their reservation. Um, the two reservations concern uh, the extent to which the parties to the settlement agreement have applied, uh, agreed to the application of the convention, and I addressed that during the course of my presentation, that was intended to offer comfort to certain uh, delegations and countries that were of the view that certain, that for them, for, for reasons of things like party autonomy, it made more sense. 
party or her acting as an agent on behalf of the secretary um, to the extent specified in the declaration. And that uh, was about really, I think, linked in, in very closely to us allowing the convention to apply not just to purely commercial situations, but also where government agencies are a party. We do not want to disturb the rules of public international law uh, on that front. And also, we wanted to give comfort to certain countries that said they, they still want to sort it out first, um, to assess their comfort level to the extent to which government agencies and others could be a party to a settlement agreement before deciding to allow the convention to apply to such cases. So all is on balance with that elaboration. I think it still comes back to the fact of giving comfort to certain delegations, and it will, at the end of the day, promote more countries to be able to sign on to the convention um, without unduly impacting the fundamental premise of the convention, which is to allow for recognition and enforcement of settlement agreements across the board in most of the cases. Thank you very much, Natalie. And, and just one final question, uh, also from uh, Olga. Uh, it's in regard to the European Union and what the, the, the approach has been from, from the European Union. So it's very difficult for me to speak definitively on behalf of the European Union, but attesting to at least what I understand of their position, um, I, I understand that there's a, a matter of discussion within the the member states of the European Union and the European Commission uh, over various issues, uh, including where, where the competence lies between the member states and the Commission. I don't profess to be an expert on EU processes and EU law, uh, but I do know that even within the EU, there are very strong supporters of the Convention um, as a promotional tool for mediation in the cross-border context. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, and uh, so without further ado, I think we'll pass the floor to, to Judith, um, who I believe has some slides that she'll be sharing with us as well. <laughs> yes, hello. I hope you hear me. I have problems. D do you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay. So you see that I'm trying desperately to uh, uh, set the... Um, the line better. I have the impression that the line is extremely bad. I didn't hear most of the presentation, so I do hope that it's only my problem and that you hear me uh, properly. So what I will be addressing in the, in the co coming 10 minutes is first what UNCITRAL really is, and uh, most of you probably now, but since I got, no, but since I got the uh, question from a Viz Muti who Mr. Uncitral was, I decided to always include that in the in the presentation, just to be uh, sure. Then I would like to shortly address the um, complete Uncitral framework on mediation. One main pillar is, of course, the Singapore Convention, which Natalie presented to you, but we have other texts that I would sh shortly like to share with you. And the third point is, um, an outlook into the future because we are discussing in the frame of working group three which is our working group dealing with isds reform we are discussing mediation and have states wanting to use uh, mediation um, in a more systematic manner in isds so let me come to the first point what is UNCITRAL? UNCITRAL stands for the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law and is an intergovernmental body with limited membership. It has been created more than 50 years ago and has the mandate to modernize and to harmonize international trade law. Limited lem membership, yes, 60 member states, and you could see here the, the uh, number of states from the different regions which allows us to be sure that the texts are drafted with a view to fit into each legal system, into each geographical region with different culture, with different approaches, um, different economic systems. So you see, we, ha we always have 40 member states from Africa, 14 from the Asia Pacific region, 10 from Latin America, and eight from the Eastern Europe, 14 from Western Europe and others. This is, uh, these uh, regional groups come from a time when we had the Cold War and 
which is why you have the European Union in two regional groups. This is so for a sort of reason, and it will probably remain like this unless we have a big uh, reform of the UN. And now what is extremely important are the observer states. So every United Nations member state is invited to all of our sessions. We do send out for every working group session, for every commission session, we do send out 193 invitations. And every state is invited to attend, to participate in the negotiation, to come with creative ideas. The only formal difference is that um, observer states do not have the right to vote. For the time being, in our history of more than 50 years, we never had a vote on substance, on law. So de facto observer states and member states have the same impact in the discussion. Um, and then we have uh, organizations, stakeholders that are invited to contribute with their expertise to make sure that our uh, texts are really taking into consideration all aspects and all make them usable in, in practice. What is also important that the negotiations are held in the six UN uh, languages, which has the necessity for us to, when starting negotiations, to really define what we are talking about. So this is something extremely, extremely important. You have a number of different uh, people in the room coming from very different areas, discussing in six languages simultaneously. So you could imagine that the outcome of such a technical discussion is something um, that uh, needs to be seen with the special, special international uh, lens, including doing the, the interpretation. And as uh, Natalie already said, we always have around 200 and more people in the room really discussing the different issues. Um, the UNCITRAL framework, which is my second topic, so you see here the UNCITRAL conciliation rules, which were already developed in 1980, which is very early for an international text on mediation. You see here, that was the time when we still used the term conciliation, not mediation. In the UNCITRAL context, these two terms are used uh, interchangeably for a process where parties request a third person to assist them in their attempt to reach an, to reach an amicable uh, settlement. So for us, conciliation and mediation is used interchangeably. This is a little bit different in the exit uh, context, but for us it's the same. Then 2002, that was already said by Natalie, we had the model law on uh, international commercial conciliation which outlines the whole mediation process. And in this 2002 model law, if you uh, look at it, you will find Article 14, which says enforcement is something the states have, every state has to deal with it because it's impossible to harmonize the whole area of uh, enforcement. Enforcement being thus too diverse. And this is why um, negotiations in that respect uh, failed. Now we are 18 years later, so this is the, the time when a person would get to their age of majority, so UNCITRAL texts are more or less doing the same. And our uh, birthday presents, if you so wish, are a complete set of, uh, of framework. So we do have the, the updated model on international commercial conciliation, which has now a title that is not really handsome, one might say. So the, the, um, the official title of the, of the updated model law from 2002 is UNCITRAL model law on international commercial mediation and international settlement agreements resulting from mediation, 2018, amending the model law on international conciliation from 2002. We, in short, call it our UNCITRAL um, mediation model law. And then we have the convention, of course, and we have two texts we are currently working on. One is the update of the conciliation rules, the 
obvious reason being that we change terminology in the sense that mediation is now the lead term and not conciliation. So we need to change the term of the, the title of the conciliation rules to make them the mediation rules. And in that, uh, while doing that, the, the commission asked the secretariat to update these rules to reflect the last 40 years. Um, and this text, this updated draft text, is now uh, in front of the commission and will hopefully be discussed uh, soon. You can already find the draft text on our website under the, the mediation rules, where all the documents for the commission are. And then we have draft no notes on mediation, the mediation notes being kind of explanation to guide users and those who are not very much um, acquainted with the, with the procedure. Here I added two slides um, with, that are very important in the context because the, the text speaks of commercial and commercial in the context of UNCITRAL does include investment. That is crystal clear, if I may say so, and Natalie already stressed that. I um, put on the slide the footnote where we define commercial and you see the investment is in the six lines hidden that this is of course part, part of it. We, we started only with the transparency uh, rules to make a differentiation between commercial, purely commercial and investment. For us in the UNCITRAL context for the last 50 years, commercial was always encompassing investment and that's why of course the Singapore Convention is also encompassing um, uh, in investment. You have though the reservation where a part of the convention may declare that it doesn't want to, uh, doesn't want to have an, uh, an application in the area of uh, of investment law. Here you do have a slide with all those states that uh, did sign up to the convention so far. We have four ratifications with only Saudi Arabia having voiced the uh, reservation number one so that it would not be applicable in, in ISDS. We are having more states that already completed the parliamentary procedure so we are just waiting for them to deposit the the ratification instrument with the treaty uh, section. Now coming to my last point, working group three, which is the working group that is dealing with the possible reform on investor state dispute settlement. We are now on the third stage of our mandate, the first stage having been identifying all issues, the second stage deciding whether these issues warrant reform, whether reform is desirable, and the third uh, stage, and this is where we are now, is developing solutions. And we have uh, mediation um, as uh, something that has been stressed by many states. So this is a working group where states tend to uh, submit a number of submissions, and we have uh, I have a number of states like Bahrain, Brazil, China, Costa Rica, European Union, Indonesia, Israel, Japan, Korea, Mali, Mexico, Peru, South Africa, Thailand, Turkey, all of them stressed in their submission that mediation is something they would really, um, that they would like to, to stress, to promote, and to find ways to better include mediation in the, in the, the ISDS. Uh, process. So ways of strengthening uh, mediation and I think this is something uh, where all of us should, should think how to do that best and what are the, the possible solutions here. The reasons for the state to do that, uh, and I'm quoting, is less time, it's less cost intensive. Uh, if you do that at an early stage, you avoid escalation. Um, to avoid formal disputes, the flexibility this process offers, the, the autonomy for the, uh, 
for the parties. And one key issue is the preservation of long-term relationship, which in ISDS translates, in, translates into retaining the investment in the state. And this is something that states want. They want to attract investment. And if there's an issue, if there is a problem, they want to retain the investor uh, in the state. The idea is not to immediately go to arbitration, but to try to to have this retaining of the investment in the state uh, be made possible in, in an enabling environment for, for mediation. This is what we would like. Um, to, to create. We, so this is what I already said, these are the perceived advantages, not resource intensive flexibility, preservation, retaining of uh, investment. And one point, if the mediation is not successful, it was said by the state that it still helps to clarify the position. So it reduces the issues if we have uh, um, a subsequent arbitration. So in any case, even if the mediation does not help, does not solve the, the dispute, it could still enormously help to reduce costs, to reduce time, and have a reduction of the issues at the stage of, of arbitration. Um, Yet if we just have a quick question along those lines, and this comes from uh, Francisco Alarcon, he's asking if there's any wording you would recommend for a in a mediation clause under the convention. This is what the working group is working on. So we we are really at the stage we are where we are trying to find solutions to these issues, um, and one solution is probably that the working group would work on. Uh, treaty language to make sure that uh, more guidance could be given to uh, states. And we have already, in more recent treaties, we have already um, more guidance given to the parties. It was stressed by states that this could be an area where we could uh, work on. Unfortunately, we should have discussed these issues in April at the last session of the working group. and. This session, for obvious reasons, did not take place. So we do hope that we will have uh, this discussion at the later stage. And I hope some sometime in, in autumn in, uh, uh, in Vienna. Thank you so much, Judith, uh, for your, your insightful uh, comments. Um, uh, Fraka, uh, we now uh, pass the floor to you. Once I have the presenter power, I will share my slides. Takes a minute. So in the meantime, welcome um, to everybody. We know we have participants um, from 50 countries, and it's really lovely that the webinar offers the opportunity uh, to reach all of you and to see that the interest in mediation is really a global phenomenon. Um, Damon, can you confirm if you can see my slide properly? Looks great. Thank you. Um, so my name is Frauke. Um, I'm the team lead and senior counsel at ICSID. Um, Celeste has kindly introduced. So big thanks to Celeste and Kirsten to organize this event for us. Um, and it's an honor certainly to be on the panel with so many distinguished uh, um, members. Today is a really happy day for ICSID um, because yesterday we received uh, the, no the instrument of ratification from Djibouti, becoming the 155th member of ICSID. And we'll see if my slide moves. Yeah. Um, and so that is one of the um, indicators that ICSID is the global leader in investment dispute resolution. And what do we offer? Many of you will be familiar with that. Under the ICSID Convention, we offer conciliation and arbitration facilities um, to resolve investor state disputes. 
and there both disputing parties need to have a link um, to a member state. In 1978, ICSID's governing body expanded that um, by opening up um, ICSID's mandate to facilitate investment disputes when only one of the disputing parties has an access to an ICSID contracting state and also expanding the offering of services to fact-finding proceedings. In green, you will see the other um, activities that we undertake. We administer trial arbitrations, or um, state-to-state cases where both parties agree, appoint arbitrators, serve as secretariat in regional trade agreements, and also assist um, with mediation. So we'll do that already. And now that leads us to the development of the exit mediation rules, which we proposed in 2018 to our member states. Judith has laid it out that uh, mediation has been um, a means considered by states at least over the past decade, also in the context of investment disputes. Um, We've been approached by member states to develop a mediation framework alongside the existing conciliation framework. We touched upon that UNCITRA there has an interchangeable approach. Under ICSID, the conciliation mandate is um, found in Article 25 of the ICSID convention and we wanted to develop an additional set of rules that provides more flexibility and a broader scope that we'll touch upon. Also about one-third of our members, um, those states that uh, form part of the Energy Charter Secretariat or conference I I should say, um, adopted in 2016 a very practical guide on investment mediation. So that was another indicator how important states consider the development of mediation to be also in the investment context. And then certainly also the practice, the statistics on um, settlements in exit arbitration every year you will see in our biannual publication of exit statistics that about 35 to 40 percent of arbitrations actually settle. Now, what what do we intend to achieve with these new settlements? I already mentioned this complementation of the mediation provisions in the new treaties, um, offer services, a broad range of services to parties to assist in investment dispute settlement, have a flexible process that's more time and cost effective, which is exactly what um, Judith had already mentioned, which came out in the UNCITRA discussions. Um, We heard uh, that from our member states too. And obviously, as a feature of mediation, um, allowing an outcome that's tailor-made um, for the parties. And then while we were drafting this, so this was in 2018, um, the Singapore Convention was still in draft format, but at that point, we certainly wanted to make sure that um, whatever we have um, and develop in the exit framework for mediation or whatever we amend in the conciliation framework, we integrate um, on the formal side, certainly that should parties want to avail themselves from the Singapore Convention mechanism, they can do so. Important point to highlight here is that participation in exit mediation is entirely voluntary. That doesn't only mean that you need to consent at the beginning that the parties agree to mediate, but what I call an ongoing consent. Unlike other exit mechanisms, um, where parties cannot unilaterally withdraw from the consent once it's given, uh, in mediation that is different. So what do we propose? Um, The Secretariat, we propose to our members that we are authorized to administer mediation proceedings that relate to an investment involving a state or an REIO. This is very broad, um, broader than the mandate and the jurisdictional limitations in additional facility or convention proceedings, which we saw on the earlier slide um, that have nexuses to exit membership. And then again, the aspect of ongoing consent. How do we commence it? Um, This is a slide that I I want to make sure for those of you who are familiar with exit processes, here it's different. On the one hand, you can initiate a mediation with what we call a pre-existing agreement, a clause for mediation in a contract, or an offer in a treaty that's been accepted, and this is um, this agreement to mediate exists at the time the disputing party submits the request for mediation to the Secretariat. 
or upon request by states for the Secretariat to be involved in the facilitation of the mediation, consent to mediation, a request may also contain an offer to the other disputing party and the Secretariat will submit that offer inviting the party to respond. Now, once the request is registered, um, the next step will be the appointment of the mediator. And what I want to focus here on is that what the mediation rules at ICSID propose is that we have either one mediator or two co-mediators, which is very normal uh, in commercial mediation, but in ICSID conciliation, for example, you still have the three-member body. So one or two co-mediators appointed by agreement of the parties. What is the role of that mediator? So the role is to assist the parties in reaching a mutually acceptable resolution of all or parts of the dispute. Judith also picked up on that piece um, that uh, mediation may also be helpful for certain aspects of the dispute and uh, the goal may not necessarily need to be to resolve everything. Of course, the mediator does not have the authority to impose a settlement and shall be impartial and independent, treat the parties fairly and provide each party with a reasonable opportunity um, to participate in the process. Now, what is the duty on the parties? They shall cooperate with the mediator and with one another. This is similar to exit conciliation and conduct the mediation in good faith expeditiously and certainly cost-effective, which is one thing that Judith also already mentioned. Um, so we see that the discussion we have in the UNCTRAL context, uh, context and in the inter-ICSID context overlap. ICSID mediation process, here you have a short overview of how does, what are, what are the steps that are taken at the outset. So we talked about the registration, the appointment of one or two co-mediators, and then once the mediator is appointed and has accepted that appointment, the parties will file brief written statements describing issues in dispute and their views on these issues and on the mediation procedure. So these are not pleadings, but it is really the um, description of the disputed issues and each party's views to assist the mediator then to conduct a first session with the parties to determine the mediation protocol and um, to also start um, a joint session or separate session at the same um, following that uh, first session to address the disputed issues. And then the mediation will be conducted in accordance with that protocol. For those of you who are very familiar with commercial mediation, this looks a little bit more formalized um, than many are used to. Uh, but given that we deal here with sovereigns, um, it is an important piece um, to put a framework of the process into place. So the mediation protocol addresses pieces like language, the place of meetings, how information disclosed in individual meetings between a party and the mediator are to be addressed, or if the parties have any agreement not to pursue or suspend other proceedings concerning the same dispute, or how disclosure of any settlement agreement resulting from the mediation should be treated. So we wanted to give that into the hands of the parties rather than to create default mechanisms from the start. What's important here is that in the context of the first session, the parties are asked to name a representative authorized to settle the dispute and to describe the process that would follow to implement the settlement. To really um, link the piece, the practical piece of implementation with the process aspect. What are the tools the mediator may use during that process? So I mentioned it already, the mediator may meet or communicate jointly or separately, request further statements or explanations. Um, our rules open it up um, but recommendations by the mediator, often called evaluative mediations, is left in the hands of the parties should they so wish. Um, so th that would require a joint request and obviously also expert advice um, may be sought by the mediator with the agreement of the parties. Termination, obviously upon the signing of a settlement agreement, or I've mentioned it, if one party wishes to unilaterally withdraw, or that the parties consider that, um, the parties or the mediator consider that um, a continuation of the mediation uh, is 
no likelihood of the resolution and this will be terminated with a notice of termination which parties may perhaps later need should you have a multi-tier clause that requires um, uh, showing that mediation has been undertaken prior to for example starting arbitration costs um, each party shall bear its own cost and the cost of the mediation itself are shared equally Confidentiality provision here is that all information relating to the mediation is confidential unless there is party agreement. An information or document is independently available or the disclosure is required by law. Um, without prejudice provision, we have that too. This is modeled after what is already in Article 35 of the Exit Convention in the context of conciliation with the goal to allow the parties to come to engage and freely participate in the mediation. So how does it fit in? Natalie um, touched upon that um, and Judith as well. Um, so and we got a re uh, we got a question on that actually prior to the um, the webinar. Um, mediation from the exit point of view is certainly not uh, to be replacing other dispute mechanism but rather offering a solution, um, an additional option for parties should they consider this process to be most suitable for their particular dispute. The mediation rules are a standalone framework. Um, we no longer propose them as part of the additional facility, especially to make sure that people, that everyone understands that these are not the limitations of the jurisdictional requirements from the additional facility do not apply in medi mediation proceedings. It's broader. And um, mediation rules can be used, as I've already mentioned, as a standalone process or combined with others. So in a multi-tier clause, or perhaps alongside an ongoing exit arbitration where parties may agree to suspend the arbitration while the mediation is ongoing. And then um, there is no issue with Article 26. I add that to the slide because that's a question we often um, uh, receive in that context. And if a settlement is reached, the parties have different choices. They may discontinue the arbitration and um, enforce settlement should enforcement really uh, be necessary. We see in the investment context that there is a lot of voluntary compliance when settlement agreements are reached. Or they may resume the arbitration and request a tribunal to embody settlement in an award. So this is a piece Natalie had mentioned in the context of the um, commercial uh, New York Convention aspect. And what Judith also mentioned, it's if only a partial settlement is reached, the parties may continue to arbitrate only those issues. So helping with the clarification of the is, dis, is disputed issues and saving cost and time uh, for the parties. And then um, what we also do at Exit, one point I want to highlight here is uh, we have investor state mediator trainings where we bring together experienced mediators and government officials. And I know we have at least one of our um, alumni uh, in the um, audience, in the webinar audience. Um, and um, our goal is here not only to disseminate information through events um, such as today, but also to build capacity um, in order to support the development of mediation and mediators in the field. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frauke. Uh, you know, a number of questions came up during the course of your presentation, but uh, fortunately your final slides uh, answered most of them. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to pass it to George for anyone whose question I was, wasn't addressed. Hopefully we'll get to that in the, in the after Gary's presentation. So thank you very much. Without further ado, George. Thank you, everyone. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, George. Okay, can hear so, you. so thank you, Young SIAT and Young Exit, for organizing this. I think it's a, it's a great initiative. Uh, I have two sons who are in their 30s, so I told them I'm doing this. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I feel young just being here. Um, all right, I, I, I think we have limited time, but in the space of, of 10 minutes, uh, and in the context of of looking at opportunities and challenges arising from the convention, 
I just want to share three points. Uh, the first is about the impact of the convention uh, on the growth of the Asian. Uh, the second is the, the growing trend uh, parties to use hybrid processes. And, and third, I'd like to touch on the role of the changing lawyer. Okay, because I, I, I think there are many lawyers out there, and this is something which I'm only announced. So first, um, on the impact of the convention on the growth of Asia. Now, Celeste, you're supposed to help me with the slides. Um, can we get my content slide? Are we having difficulties, Celeste? Having some technical difficulties with the slides. Uh, George, if you're able to continue, we'll keep working. Okay, there. I'll do that. All right. So, Natalie talked about touch on, on the convention. Uh, just a bit of background, she, I mean, I, I, I think we're thankful to her to trial for actually starting this. Uh, it was working group two, 50 countries were represented at the trial. We had meetings for close to four years in Vienna and New York. Um, Natalie was elected the chair, I was part of the Singapore delegation. You know, for me, this was really a learning experience. I've been a lawyer for 38 years, but this really was, was the icing, uh, a, a tremendous experience. It was like a giant mediation for me. You know, I've been meeting for 23 years, but this was, you know, parties from different countries, different jurisdictions, uh, civil law, common law jurisdictions, different languages, all with different interests, social, economic, political. Um, but we were able to, within three odd years, okay, able to put together a uh, draft in terms of uh, tax and public attention. And I was so happy and so proud in February 2018 when you all had this big photograph and said that this was the tax. But you know, if you ask naturally and, 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 and me personally, how many people, how many countries would sign? I think if you told me 10 countries would sign on the 7th of August, I would say, yeah, great. But we had 46 countries. Okay? It was a surprise. 46 countries signed on the 7th of August. Um, and significantly, um, the U.S. side, China side, U.S. China, <laughs> India side, and, and to me, that was really, it's, it's more than half the world's population. That's the significance. Okay. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Yeah. So you see there the countries which have signed, and I've added China, India, and, and the U.S. Uh, and since then, We've had six other countries which have signed, so we've got 52 countries, and you've heard from uh, Frauke and, and, and Natalie, four countries have ratified it. Belarus has come on to say that they will be ratifying soon, so I think we will have more ratifications, and, and the instrument will come uh, to effect on September 12th. Now, how has this translated to, to the ground? I mean, it's, it's all very nice to say, hey, you know, we've got this convention. But what does it mean to people? What does it mean to business? What does it mean on the, on the ground? You know, for me at SIMC, I, we are a non-profit organization. We promote uh, the mediation of the disputes. We are very young. We are like five years old. Um, we work very closely with SIMC. Um, Vinder Singh, who is the chair of SIMC, is on my board as well. And we work together. Um, and so we've been promoting mediation. And I will tell you this very quickly. You know, it, We've been going to China, India, South Korea, Japan, and five years ago, when you talk about mediation, people look at you. You, know? uh, you just go knocking on doors, you make cold calls. But today, there is a real genuine interest in mediation. So last week, I was on a Zoom conference with Koreans, with the KCAD. Uh, today, I was on a Zoom conference with Japanese mediators, and, and this is what's happening on the ground. Now, let me just quickly take one example. India. India, I've got many friends in India. Uh, and my mediator friends there tell me, look, you know, for many years they have been trying to get mediation moving, but it's not happening, it's not really happening, it's a bit difficult. But in India's case, okay, during working group two, we were trying to get India to commit to signing the convention. And only so it will take some time. We support it, it takes some time. But now we know that one week before the signing on the seventh of August, um, Prime Minister would be at a cabinet meeting. And he said it will sign. And not only that, they came up with a, an announcement that they will also amend laws to make 
mitigation a part of the dispute resolution scheme. Okay. So that has had real impact. And in February, can I just put the next slide, please? In February this year in Delhi, I was invited to speak at an arbitration conference. Okay. That was my last trip for travel restrictions that came about. And the Chief Justice of India, Chief Justice of the, okay, was the guest speaker. Okay. And this is an arbitration conference. Uh, and there he is talking about mediation. And you see that this people asking what they say, look, we're going to look at pre litigation mediation. And I know today they are looking at a mediation act. So this is what's happening in the ground. It is being translated. It's happening all over many other countries. I'm sure the other speakers will know this. But to me, um, the convention has had a phenomenal impact on the use of mediation. Okay, that's my first point. Um, second point, the growing trend in these hybrid processes. And I'm talking about this within the dispute resolution world. Um, we've had court litigation for many years, and, and now, as in Singapore, we've got SICC, the Singapore International Court. Court. Uh, but mediation has come to be used with litigation, with arbitration. At SIAC and SIMC, we have had this protocol for five years, pre-convention, okay, a one-stop process where if you're concerned about enforceability, uh, come, you file your cases in arbitration, file the, the, the initial papers, um, and then, by agreement of parties, the arbitration is stayed for a maximum of eight weeks, and then the case is transferred to an SIMC, where we will arrange and organize the mediation. The mediator is a different person um, from the arbitrator. If, if the mediation is successful, goes back to the arbitrator who was appointed, and there's the settlement agreement which we call it a consent arbitral award, which is impossible for the convention. So that was our answer to possibility. And of course, if the matter doesn't settle at mediation, then it goes back to arbitration. So it's a genuine process. And you know, there has been a great, great interest in this. And I think the convention, people are looking forward to the convention, but it will take some time for it to come back, for more countries to ratify. And before that, I will tell you this, this is something which is happening. Hybrid processes, uh, meta, up meta. Uh, so I tell, I tell all, all my friends, I tell young people who come to me, that this is something which you should look out for. Okay? Um, the trend, and, and, and to be able to service that trend as lawyers, as litigators, as arbitrators, and litigators. Which comes to my third point, which is really about the changing world of the lawyer. The future. Uh, I think many of, of you in the audience are lawyers, um, so this is actually dedicated to me. Um, maybe the next slide. You know, when we go around the world talking to businesses, we talk to people, companies directly. This is the message that's given to us. Okay? Parties, businesses, they're not interested in long drawn out battles, whether it calls our attention. Okay? Uh, this is the reality. Maybe we are, you know, as lawyers or as uh, people who are involved in the law. But the parties, the business people are not. They're tired. Okay? They just want to get their problem solved. So I have been a litigator, arbitrator, and mediator for 38 years. Okay? But you know, the parties do not see us as litigators or arbitrators or mediators. Uh, they are looking for problem solvers. So to me, um, my son, one of my sons is a lawyer. I tell him, I tell him, look, if you want to make a future, okay, see yourself as a problem solver. And in order for you to do that, you need to equip yourself with different skills. Okay? You just can't be a litigator. You have to learn to be an arbitrator. You have to learn mediation skills. And if you can do that, I think you have, you have an advantage. Because clients come to you who are able to design a dispute resolution process which fits the case which fits the client's ability and capacity. And for me, that, that is the way um, the speed resolution should be. So these are the three points that I, I, I think I'd like to share. Uh, I hope it helps people to, to start thinking about it. But mediation is here to stay. Uh, in fact, in India, at the conference, someone said it's unstoppable. Uh, I think the, the, the rise, the trend to use hybrid processes, combination of processes, uh, and of course, for us, 
service uh, applied to be able to say, yes, I can do all three. I can, I can, I can design something that solves a the problem, solves a dispute. So on that note, thank you very much. Thank you very much, George, uh, for, for your, both your advice and then the, the background provided. Um, we have a question from uh, Tamara Morchil Daze, uh, and she basically asks if there's a specific type of investment dispute or a specific type of dispute that you think is suited to mediation. Oh, I would tell uh, okay. <laughs> all these disputes are suitable for mediation, unless the parties are not willing to go for mediation. And I think in the end, it depends on the willingness. Any type of dispute, I mean, I've, I've done investigative disputes, I've done disputes with involving governments, uh, I've done small cases as well, but really it's about the art, it's the willingness for the party to come and sit down, talk through your problems, and find a solution. To follow up on, did, can, can you hear me now? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you. Following up on the advice to young lawyers, um, it seems like nowadays, especially in litigation, at least in the United States, uh, parties often take very maximalist approaches and uh, come out very strong and very aggressively. And I was wondering if, if there's any um, tip you could share in terms of how to de-escalate a dispute, how to how to tone things down as opposed to to ramping things up, which we often see these days. I'm joking. Take a card and shoot the person. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think, you know, we play a role there. So if, if I'm a lawyer and for that party, we look, in mediation, we look at the underlying concerns or interests of the parties. What's really best for you? Don't settle for the other party, settle for yourself. So if we can find an interest which, you know, is important for the party and say, look, why did you give me a shot? One day, two days, what have you got to lose? Try it out. Okay, and maybe we can meet your concerns because of one day. If you don't succeed, at least you know you've tried your best. At least you know issues have been crystallized. This saves time, this saves costs. And maybe down the road, one of you will still want artists may still want to talk and come to the center. So there, there is value in that. To me, as, as human beings, there is always value uh, in trying to dialogue and trying to find a way out. So I tell people, don't. No, you can talk it out or you can fight it out. Don't try talking about this. And maybe, Diego, I can offer here some statistics. I have an affinity to data. Um, and what we've had uh, seen is an AMI survey, the International Mediation Institute, suggesting that um, an enforcement mechanism like the Singapore Convention for Mediated Settlements, may, they, the, res the responses were that 84% of um, general counsels or big company uh, general counsels would be more inclined to use mediation as a start. So to pick up on what George just said, encourage the client, and now that seems to be translating into the data on the ground as well. Thank you very much, Frank, and thank you, thank you very much, George, for, for uh, your words and your advice. Um, without further ado, uh, Pass the floor to Gary. Thanks so much, and thank you also for for the introduction. Um, thanks to all the participants as well from from all over the world for attending. The the subject of, of this this webinar is um, acutely important, and we sometimes I think in the detail lose lose sight of the broader purpose. Global trade, international commerce is absolutely essential to the well-being of, of our world, of, of all of us, and the pandemic, recent events, I think, really underscore that. The basic purpose of the Singapore Mediation Convention, like its brother or sister, the New York Convention, is to make global trade, international commerce work better. And they both, I think, um, do so, and especially in the case of the Singapore Convention, have the, the prospect of, of doing so in, in the future. Being able to resolve business disputes, whether domestically or internationally, is absolutely essential to business itself. If parties can't enforce their contracts, if they can't enforce their agreements efficiently and expeditiously, then they're not going to enter into those contracts, or if they do, they're not going to, to 
comply with them. A framework like the New York Convention, like the Unsatural Model Law and International Commercial Arbitration has been utterly essential over the last six decades plus in the growth of, of international trade and also the growth of international trade on fair and legitimate terms, terms that the parties have negotiated with each other and that don't result from coercion or state influences, things of, of that sort. The convention has ensured a, a level playing field in which parties are treated with, with equality under the rule of law. And the Singapore Mediation Convention will continue in that tradition, augmenting what it is that the New York Convention has, has done so well. It's worth thinking a little bit as well about some of the differences in the first days, weeks, months, perhaps years, of each of the two conventions, the Brothers and Sisters New York Convention and the Singapore Convention. The New York Convention was the product of the New York Conference, one um, series of, of hot weeks in New York in 1958. Forty-six countries coincidentally participated in that conference, but out of those 46 countries, only 23 or so actually signed the convention. And getting even those countries, not to mention others, subsequently to ratify the convention, bring it into legal effect, proved to be quite difficult. The convention, although it looms so large in our consciousness today in international dispute resolution, actually got off to a pretty slow start. And in that regard, I think it's it's instructive to look at what has happened with the Singapore Convention because as George and others have pointed out, it's garnered 46 uh, signatures already in the first months of its life and it has come into force, legal force, because of the ratifications um, much more quickly than, than most conventions, including the, the New York Convention do. That is a, a striking set of achievements for the Singapore Convention, and I think augur quite well for the future. George has, um, in many ways, discussed quite well the cooperation between the institution that, that I'm associated with, the Singapore International Arbitration Center, and if I can put it this way, his, his institution, the Singapore International Mediation Center, like the Singapore Mediation Convention and the New York Convention, the two institutions, SINC, SIAC, are brothers and sisters in the sense, perhaps, perhaps partners is a better way to put it, because we both cooperate very closely, both through the ARB Med, ARB mechanism that, that George has described so well, and otherwise in resolving international business disputes. We do that, of course, with other partners, the Singapore courts, um, courts around the world for that matter. Um, are essential to making sure that arbitration agreements are given their full effect and that arbitral awards are respected. Singapore courts, with their expertise in the field, have led the region, have led the world in some respects in the last decade in developing a robust body of pro-arbitration law, and one can expect that they will do so with particular attention to the Singapore Mediation Convention. From a practical perspective, just one set of tips in a sense, or one tip perhaps, um, given the interest that some of the previous questions have, have shown, one often is tempted, one often sees in fact in practice, arbitration clauses that are so-called multi-tier clauses or hybrid clauses, clauses that provide for arbitration, unsurprisingly, of all disputes relating to the parties' agreement. But prior to arbitration occurring, a mandatory mediation or conciliation period, sometimes called a cooling off period, alternatively, um, simply a, a, an obligation for a, a specified period to negotiate in good faith. These types of provisions have the best of intentions, the very best of intentions. But as sometimes is said, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. And if one is going to adopt those types of provisions, provisions that, if I can put it this way, insert a mandatory negotiation, cooling off, 
mediation period prior to arbitration or for that matter litigation, one must draft with care. Those types of provisions can be interpreted sometimes as jurisdictional requirements. Those jurisdictional requirements can result in an arbitration goes forward, a subsequent challenge by way of annulment or non-recognition to, to the award. On the theory that the parties only agreed to arbitrate if they had properly in good faith negotiated for a specified period of time prior to commencing either litigation or arbitration, or alternatively that they had mediated for a specified period of time. I think George's point that the real way you resolve disputes by mediation is if the parties are willing to do so is, is fundamentally important and one should not lose sight of that. And when awards made after parties have tried to mediate but failed or seen the mediation is a hopeless prospect, those awards are annulled. I think that is in fact inconsistent with the objectives of parties both in agreeing to mediate and then conducting the mediation. The art med art process, which leaves the door open throughout the arbitral process for parties to go to mediation, sometime with the encouragement of the arbitral tribunal, and as in the case of SIC, the arbitral institution, I think is, is a more profitable way, a more effective way than uh, a multi-tier dispute resolution provision. Be that as it may, if, if, if parties wish to, to use a multi-tier dispute resolution provision, they should be mindful of the jurisdictional, the admissibility, the other types of issues that those can throw up. Sometimes they can produce more delays, more costs, more legal proceedings than, than they're meant to solve. And thus, although mediation is an essential part of any dispute resolution process, using it properly, just like using arbitration or other mechanisms is, is equally essential. I hope that's addressed some of the questions that have been left open. The prior presentations, I think, were extraordinarily useful, and I hope I've added a little bit to the overall picture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. That's, that's incredibly helpful. So just one question that, that comes to mind. Uh, given your experience as an arbitrator and, and the number of arbitrations you've, you've sat as an arbitrator in, um, is there uh, is there any characteristic of the parties that, that you've seen over time that, that is, leads them to be more conducive to reaching a settlement? And what do you think the role of an arbitrator is really in, in allowing the parties to achieve that? That's a great question. And I think it goes back in a sense to, if I recall a prior question, what, what disputes are most suited for, for mediation? I mean, I think, I think George is absolutely right that all disputes are suited for mediation and equally for, for settlement in a sense. My own personal experience, though, has been when parties are engaged in a long-term enterprise, a long-term relationship, um, as opposed to a one-off commercial transaction, a, a, a single sale of goods, a single delivery, a single license, perhaps, for, for a particular usage, um, then both settlement and mediation I think are particularly attractive. Obviously, settlement and mediation are attractive in all cases. If settlement can be reached, it saves time and money. It, it creates certainty. It enables the parties not to have a solution imposed on them, but, but to consensually structure um, a, a resolution. That said, I think parties are most likely to do that when they have a long-term relationship that they both presumptively are invested in and want to preserve. When they have a multifaceted relationship, which enables them, if I can put this crudely, to, to trade different things in different aspects of, of their relationship, ideally to produce a win-win situation. Many disputes prove not to be capable of that, um, but often it may be because parties aren't encouraged um, quite as much or aren't as open-minded once hostilities begin to exploring something that involves the other side winning a little something as well. I think arbitrators' role varies um, in, in using mediation, conciliation, settlement efforts from, from legal culture to legal culture. The orthodox learning, of course, is that civil lawyers, the Zurich tradition, um, are particularly likely to, and, and indeed in, in, in 
the view of some, required to both propose and attempt to facilitate settlement, often doing things that look a lot like mediation. The common law tradition, I think, is a little more wary of the arbitrator who must ultimately adjudicate based upon a, a formal evidentiary record, stepping into a conciliation role that involves ex parte communications. I think the critical point, though, is that arbitrators in any jurisdiction are permitted to encourage the parties to explore mediation and perhaps depending on the arbitration agreement, even permitted to direct parties to, to, to do so. Um, concerns about a blurring of the role between mediator and arbitrator, I think can be addressed in a sense, just the way that SIC and SIMC work together. The arbitrator doesn't act as mediator. He sends them next door to, to George and um, the SIMC, and a mediator there can do what what she or he is, is is appointed and trained to do, namely mediate a dispute that that um, that could be ultimately resolved by arbitration if that unfortunately becomes necessary. That's very helpful. And, and, and just to follow up on that, Gary, and, and this is really, and we can also open this up to the panel as, as a whole. Um, I, do you have any specific thoughts on, on the, the qualifications and the duties of an arbitrator versus a mediator? Because I mean, they are, in fact, quite different roles. I, I agree with that. Just, others, I have no idea what the others on the panel will say. And like you, I'm, I'm more interested in what they have to say than what I have to say. My own view for what it's worth is I think that a mediator needs to be, in many cases, perhaps not all, more of a business person, a businesswoman, a businessman, in the sense of being prepared to and skilled at proposing what I might call non-legal solutions. Obviously, in some sense, they are legal solutions because they're going to resolve the dispute in a binding fashion. But proposing things that that enable the dispute to be resolved in a win-win way, thinking creatively about alternatives that um, um, that might be explored, being able to explain in very practical terms, not necessarily the legalities of what Clause 2.1 of the contract means or why an award might or might not be subject to recognition or challenge, but but being able to take a bigger, a more global perspective that can appeal both to, to in-house counsel and also to, to the business people at, at the client who at the end of the day are are the ultimate clients. I think I think the mediator's role focuses on those aspects, whereas the arbitrator's role, and I certainly don't want to to make this look like too hermetically sealed boxes or categories, but the arbitrator's role is is more in, in the adjudicative procedure, understanding the law. The, the, the judge, the arbitrator as well, is presumed to know the law, and thus I think the focus very much is on law. To be sure, with a strong commercial component, that's why parties agree to arbitrate, but, but if I were going to describe the, the different characteristics or perhaps more accurately, the different center of gravity of the two two roles, it would it would be in, in that way. But as you started out by saying, I'd love to hear what others have to say. Does anyone please chime in? So I I like what Gary said. Um, and, and for me I, I teach mediation as well. And, I, and people ask me what makes a good mediator. Okay. And, and for me, it's a role, a role that you play. I mean, you, you can be a good arbitrator as well as a mediator, but you've got to get into the role. Uh, and in Singapore, you know, we like to use a lot of uh, alphabets. And I say it's the three Ps. Uh, and the first P, can anyone guess? <laughs> I say you need to have people skills to be a mediator. You need to be able to get people to talk, uh, to be able to, to, to tell you their real concerns. Just talk. It's not, it, it's not all the time that we just tell you that it's to blab it out. It's going to build rapport, build the trust, and then what are people's real concerns. So people still. And the second P is you need to know how to use a process. You see, in mediation, we've got different stages, and we tell, tell people you use the stages uh, in different ways um, so to, to, to the best effect. And the third P is problem-solving skills. Because it's not no point just to talk. 
but you want to be able to translate it to solving the problem, to solve the dispute. So um, when we train people, this is copyrighted by me. <laughs> I tell people, <laughs> if you've got the three piece, you've been a good mediator. <laughs> uh, thank you. And just a, a quick question uh, for Natalie on that same uh, topic. When, when, when the Singapore Convention was being uh, drafted and negotiated, was there a discussion of this and, and what uh, qualities needed to be put into the actual Singapore Convention? Um, thanks very much, Diogo. We didn't quite talk about the qualities that are um, expected of a mediator per se, but there was recognition of factors such as how, and I think this also relates to another question that came up in, in the chat group, um, which is whether or not cultural norms influence how mediation is conducted and how do we deal with factors such as that. And how the convention deals with those situations or how we sought to address that was to provide a very broad definition of mediation. Um, it, it, you don't have to use a particular term, you don't have to use a particular process, uh, and the convention will be able to apply uh, so long as we're dealing with a situation where the disputing party sought to resolve the dispute with the involvement of a third party who doesn't have the authority to impose an outcome. Uh, of the disputing parties. And so I think in that way, it kind of uh, supports what George says in terms of the three Ps. Uh, whatever process that you might want to use, whatever problem-solving skills that you might want to employ, the convention uh, would be supportive of that in the way that it is broad in the framing of mediation and bring that, bring those kinds of processes under the convention. And, and just in terms of drafting, is, is there similar language in terms of the the strict requirements of uh, impartiality and dependence. I mean, it, you know, and in a judicative role, that might be much uh, more rigid. I don't know if there was any difference in, in that in the convention. So this was also something that's quite uh, heavily discussed and plays into the mediator misconduct point in uh, subparagraph E and F of the grounds of refusal. And so we, in the end, we didn't uh, write anything specific. Uh, that talked about independence and impartiality. I think a lot of a lot of the um, concerns that the negotiators had was whatever we provide for in this convention, the grounds of refusal shouldn't open the door to uh, extensive satellite litigation. Um, and so the grounds that were identified eventually were distilled to what we thought was um, really strictly uh, strictly important that impacted the eventual outcome uh, of, the, of the decisions of the disputing parties in terms of, where, of their consent to be party to the settlement agreement. So the issue of independence and impartiality is what does that mean in the mediation context if a mediator as part of the process decides to spend a little bit more time with one party in a caucus, one disputing party in a caucus than with another, then would that mean that he's not been impartial, he's not been independent, in, or because he's got a particular um, knowledge and experience in the field, does that go towards questions of uh, impartiality towards the subject? Um, and so we, we wanted to make sure that these were not issues that um, played into extensive satellite litigation. And that is why you see that eventually with the grounds of refusal, um, it's really about the disputing parties. Were they able to freely consent to the eventual mediated settlement agreement? or not, notwithstanding what might have happened, uh, and how the mediator chose to handle that particular mediation for their particular dispute. Thank you, Natalie. So I see we've reached our time, um, and I, I think that uh, your, your point that you're concluding on in terms of the just going back to consent, and as George and Gary said, going back and listening to the parties and, uh, and you know, providing for the remedies that they need uh, as problem solvers and um, just remembering the role that you know, mediation and arbitration, all of these are, you know, to avoid uh, more serious conflicts. Uh, uh, you know, arbitration also has a history of rising up gunboat diplomacy, uh, and I think that this discussion today was very interesting, going from the, the specific details of of the convention to the, the interaction of, of lawyers and arbitrators and, and uh, all of us working together in this field. Um, so, without uh, further ado in the interest of time, I think it's, it, we all need to conclude, but I want to thank everybody uh, who joined us uh, from
various different jurisdictions. I want to thank the panelists uh, for your uh, your great contributions, and uh, I hope this is a conversation that we all continue to have. Uh, thank you very much.